twice a stranger. It's a big one, uh, the issues of uh, migration, immigration, belonging and belonging. Uh, it's a thing that, uh, that centers around the Eastern Mediterranean. It's, uh, it's put together by the uh, Institute of Eastern Mediterranean Studies here at Emmanuel College. And we are very uh, fortunate this evening to have with us a, uh, somebody that's uh, not only from the area, but somebody that knows the area, and someone that uh, has studied the area and lives the area. Uh, when uh, I spoke to uh, Professor Boriadis uh, for the first time on the phone, he suggested the topic. Uh, I have to admit, I have to look at the map find out exactly what the topic or the focus could be. But I trusted uh, his suggestion because I know his work uh, in areas uh, that have to do with Turkey. And, uh, again, thanks to uh, the Consul General uh, for making this possible for us this evening. Uh, I will say a couple of words for uh, about Dr. Dimitriadis, who is with us. And I will yield the floor, which is not easy for me to do, but I will do it anyway. <laughs> Age, you realize your limitations. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Professor Grigoriadis uh, studied law at the University of Athens, and he has a master's degree from Columbia University. Uh, he has his PhD from the University of London. He has uh, written extensively on issues that have to do with uh, religion, nationalism. Turkey and Greece, minorities in the Eastern Mediterranean. Since 2009, he's at Kent University, he's a professor of political science, and we are very, very fortunate. To have him. Thank you very much for this very generous introduction. So, what you're alive. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. Let me also begin by thanking Professor Ron Matas and the Institute of East Mediterranean Studies here at the Marian College for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be with you this evening. The topic of my uh, presentation is not a very long one. The Gagaus community has not attracted particular academic uh, and scholarly attention. And I find this quite uh, intriguing. Why? Because, as I will try to explain, it is a case of an ethnic community that has uh, broken a lot of stereotypes. Uh, so looking into a community that apparently has Turkic origins, that is a devout Christian Orthodox community, and belongs to the Rumilet throughout the Ottoman years and then becomes a point of contestation between Bulgarian, Greek, and Turkish nationalism. In the late uh, 20th century, I think all these elements together bring, make up for a very interesting case. And I was, I took the opportunity to study the uh, Gagaus uh, with their main focus in the Republic of Moldova today, because as I will explain, the majority of the population of Gagaus live in Moldova today. Uh, because of my participation in the Horizon 2020 European Union funded project, the European Union funds collaborative research projects involving uh, a high number of uh, academic institutions in Europe and the candidate states. So, um, like Wilken is part of a project involving Black Sea academic institutions. So there are universities and research institutions from Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, Bulgaria, Romania. And the theme is to highlight intellectual and cultural interactions between the coasts of the sea. So in a sense, it's like similar an argument like about like the Eastern Mediterranean. So in that respect, how the sea brings people closer and sort of connects people. So I decided to, together with a student of mine, to work on the Gagaos and highlight how this community has navigated through uh, like the end of the age of empires, the end of the Russian Empire, the end of the Ottoman Empire, communism, and uh, the end of the Cold War. So what I'll try to do today is to try to situate 
this community, which is mainly based in the Republic of Moscow, but there are some communities in Greece, in Bulgaria, in Ukraine, and Romania. And I will try to uh, explain how the nation building process happened in this small population through the instruments of the literature nation, but mainly Anthony Smith's work on ethno symbolism and the difference between ethnic, ethnic communities and national communities. So let me show you a map first to identify the area we're talking about. This is the Republic of Moldova, <coughs> which historically used to be called Bessarabia, which was a territory that was contested between the Ottoman and the Russian empires. Eventually, uh, in the early 19th century, it became Russian. And that's the time, apparently, when most of the Gagos community moved there. So, as you'll see, uh, uh, the settlement of the Gagos community in the south of Moldova had to do with the Russian Ottoman War, the expulsion of the Muslim population of this territory, and Russian invitation to Christian populations on the Balkans, including the Gagos, to settle there. So, what you see as uh, white dot on the left and the yellow dot on the right map is what is called today the autonomous territorial unit of Moldova. So the Gagos community enjoys some autonomy in Moldova today. And the name is interesting for those of you who speak Turkish or find it very easy. It's called, it's called Gagos Yeril. This is the place of the Gagos, which is sort of, it's in, in like, Turkish from Turkey, it sounds odd, but also familiar to some degree because it's very unofficial. It's a very unofficial way to call something like in this sense. So, Komrad is the capital of this region. And uh, the other map I would like to show you is the map of Dobruja. Dobruja is a historic region of the West Balkans, of the West Black Sea coast, which today belongs to Romania and Bulgaria. And this is the area where historically the Gagos community was based until this resettlement to Moldova happened in the beginning of the 19th century. So this is the historic homeland of the Gagos, but in modern times, in modern years, it is Moldova that has become the focal point of the development of the Gagos community. So, as I said, I am using Anthony Smith as an instrument, his theory on ethno-symbolism and territorial and ethnic nations in order to identify what the Gagos community is. I think this distinction between an ethnic and a nation is particularly important because it helps us very often explain many of the kind of very complex identity situations in the Balkans, whereby you may have some communities that feel a sort of solidarity, but without having a political agenda supporting it, without having a political cause. So they may feel different from the greater national group, but this difference doesn't come to the point of trying to break the national unity, break sort of identify a different national identity in that respect. So, very often in the history of the 19th century, there was a transition between from ethnic groups to national groups. So we can talk about the rise of Bulgarian nationalism, that, or Albanian nationalism, or Greek nationalism earlier. But there have been uh, ethnic groups that never developed sort of a nationalist movement, like the Black community in Greece, for example. So there were some sort of People felt that they belonged to a group, but this, they didn't feel that this group would, would bring them against the main sort of national. So the Gagos, in my argument, fits into this paradigm as an ethnic group which hasn't so far developed a national center of identification, but the fact that there is a territorial unit in Moldova may provide the opportunity for this development to happen in the, in the near future. Having said that, 
uh, it is still possible to identify connections and links with Greek, Bulgarian, and Turkish national movements because of the unfinished nature of the project. So there are some gagaos who go closer to Greece. There are some gagaos who go closer to Bulgaria. There are some gagaos who go to Turkey and they feel like a Turkish diaspora in Moldova. So it is a very sort of complex uh, situation. Uh, how is this? Uh, how can ethnic groups develop into a national sort of group? Smith argues that there are certain sets of conditions. So a homeland is necessary, no matter whether it is real or sort of like so conventional. As, as I've tried to tell you before, it is the Dobrojaik region that is the historic homeland of the Gagos, but in modern terms, it is Moldova that becomes the homeland. So right now, nation building of the Gagos happens in Moldova. It's no more about the historic homeland, but about the real territory that the community controls. Another very important parameter is identifying uniqueness. So how can the Gagos be different from the nearby Romanians, Moldovans, Bulgarians, Greeks? So how is this being identified? Something to be proud about, a degree of superiority. So any national nation builders try to identify why one should be proud of being a member of this community and not ashamed of being. Of course, shared culture and religion plays a major role here. It is important to highlight how devout the Gagos community is. It is one of the most important elements of the Gagos uh, identity. And it's very interesting because of the Turkic background. You know, this appears to be sort of a paradox because like in like in mainstream understanding of identities in the Balkans, like Turkish means Muslim. Although Turkey, the Republic of Turkey, has been established as a secular state, it hasn't been able to overcome this when it comes to sort of issues about minorities, and I not only refer to the sort of non-Muslims, but even to the Alevis, for example. So being an Alevi and being a, a, a Turk is not exactly understood. It, it was even problematic before AKP came to power. Now, of course, with AKP government, things have become more extreme to that respect. So. Uh, one to be a sort of a fully fledged Turkish citizen one has to be a devout Sunni Muslim. Otherwise, the sort of there is a question mark. That's the understanding of the mainstream understanding of the church. So, uh, last but not least, uh, one needs an intelligentsia. One needs some figures that are likely to put forward the intellectual project that is mainly aiming to identify the elements of a new national culture and uh, turn this into a political movement. So this is also very important. So having said all this, let me look into the history of the of the Gagaos community. There is a lot of discussion and sort of it's a very debated issue in the literature. As we said, this third you know post population and I do mention figures talk about 250,000 people, more or less. So this is the size of the community in Moldova. Maybe 30,000 in Greece, 50,000 in Ukraine, 50,000 in Bulgaria. So overall, it's about 500,000 people we're talking about. So that's the size of the, of the community. There is a debate about the origins of the, of the Gagao. So how did they come? Where did they come from? There are some claims trying to link them to Thracian tribes, which I don't find very convincing because there's no evidence, no scientific evidence about this. There are, Pliny refers to some Thracian tribes like the Katabus. So this is, it's a name that sounds like the Gagaos, but there's no more evidence like this. Most of the literature debates whether the Gagaos come from either the Turkic uh, tribes that were introduced, uh, entered the Balkans from the Danube in the 7th and 8th century. We talk about the Pechenegs, the Kipchaks, the Kumans. So, Turkic populations that moved from what is today Ukraine to the Balkans. And they were Christianized. 
and they settle in the area of Dobruja. So this is the first argument. The second argument refers to a population transfer from, the, from Anatolia that happened in the 13th century. And this refers to uh, an interesting historic, an, inter, an interesting personality like Sultan Kaikaus II, who was one of the Seljuk sultans of the Sultanate of Rum. So he was a, a Seljuk sultan who was who had a Christian great mother, and apparently was sort of very close to the Greek and Christian culture of Anatolia. So. At some point, he established an alliance with Michael VIII, who was the king of Nicaea Empire that eventually liberated Constantinople from the Crusaders in 1261. And uh, in the context of this alliance, his troops fought together with the Paleologi in their struggles against the Crusaders. And when Kaikaus lost a dynastic struggle within the Seljuk Sultanate. Uh, Paleologus let him settle in Dobruja. So he, uh, him and a group of people moved from Anatolia to Dobruja. So this appears to be the case. We don't know, though, however, whether they settled, they settled in areas that were previously inhabited by Turkic populations. So both might be happening together. So it's not just that everybody came from Anatolia. They may have settled in an area where there were some Kipchak and Kuman Christians. So they were Turkic groups, but not originated from Anatolia. And there is a linguistic difference between the two. So it would be possible to identify sort of cultural differences between these groups. So they weren't identified. So, uh, this unit, this sort of autonomous province, survives in the area of Dobruja for about 100 years. And when the Ottomans occupy, conquer the Balkans, this uh, unit comes to an end. So then we witness the first diasporic movement of the Gagaos community. So the Gagaos get dispersed from Dobruja, and there is a unit population that moves to Eastern Thrace, near Edirne, in the Hafsa province. And there are some other Gagaos that settled near Seres in Zihni. So there is another sort of uh, group of uh, villages that are Gagaos villages, but they refer to this population movement of the 14th century. So when Constantinople is conquered and the what we call as the millet system is eventually established, the Gagaos identify themselves fully with the room millet. So they don't, uh, because religion, as we said, is such a strong element of their identity, they don't consider the fact that it's a Turkish Ottoman state, it doesn't matter for them. So they identify with the Greek Orthodox community fully and completely. And that's how the Ottoman state considers them as well. So, the next stage in their, like a very important moment in Kagao's history, as we said, is this Ottoman-Russian war of the early 19th century that results in the Russian invasion of the Balkans and the Dobruja. And uh, the Ottomans had to cede Bessarabia to, to the Russians. So, as the Russians withdraw from the Balkan territories, they apparently give incentives to the Gagaos and other Christians from the Balkans to resettle in the newly conquered territory. So they were promising them land or sort of like freedom, like against the sort of the Ottoman sort of rule. At the same time, they were, they cleansed all the vast populations living in these territories. So these leads to a resettlement of a significant part of the Gagos population from the Dobruja region to the Bessarabian region. And this is why Moldova today is the core Gagos uh, settlement, the core Gagos territory. 
course, in the 19th century, things change because uh, the rulement becomes fragmented. So the Bulgarian national movement emerges, the Albanian national movement emerges, the patriarchy tries to resist against the fragmentation of the Greek Orthodox left, but uh, nationalism is such a strong political movement that uh, whole new national movements emerge out of the Greek Orthodox left. So uh, many Bulgarian nationalists consider the Gagaus as Turk upon Bulgaria. So they kind of treat them like the Karamanlı population in the Greek national context. Uh, they were Turkish speakers, but they're Bulgarians because they're Orthodox. And of course, this uh, in this case, it helped more because the Gagaos were mainly residing together with the Bulgarian population. So in Dobruja, like the, the other important community were the Bulgarians. And similar was the case in Moldova too, in West Arabia, because together with the Gagaos, there was a resettlement of Bulgarian population. <coughs> Nevertheless, there was very little success of enlisting the Gagaos community, the Bulgarian national movement. Most of them remained loyal to the Patriarchate, so they remained sort of loyal members of the Rumilet, very traditional in that respect. And first attempts to write the Gagaos language were in Greek. So there were some, of course, something I haven't mentioned that the language was never written, it was like an oral language. So first attempts was, were made in Greek, although eventually later they would use the Cyrillic and the Latin-based alphabet, Latin-based alphabet because of the Romanian rule, as we see. The territory will change hands in the following decades. As we, I sort of, uh, I implied before, with the end of the First World War, we have uh, the Russian Revolution, Bessarabia changing hands, so more what uh, the Gagaus territory joins Romania, so it's no more Russian territory. And uh, relations with the Romanian authorities are rather problematic because Romania is employing assimilation policies. So they try to sort of Romanize sort of the populations of Moldova. And uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty and instability also involving the Gagos communities in Eastern Thrace. The Eastern Thrace community is all victims of population exchange. So the population of Eastern Thrace is expelled to Greece. So Greece has two different Gagos communities. So one that refers to the movement of the 14th century and the second, which is 1922, population exchange. And these are the people who live in Evros, or in the North Evros villages. And some of them also settled in Ceres, like incidentally again in the area where there were other Gagos <coughs> communities from the 14th century. So meanwhile, in the interwar years, Turkey develops for the first time an interest in the, in the Gagos community. There is an ambassador of Turkey in, to Romania. That's the time when that, the territory is Romanian, right? So it is under the Romanian jurisdiction. That is organizing a sort of campaign to settle Muslim uh, peasants from Romania to Turkey. That was a very widespread project in the 1920s and 30s in light of the decimation of the rural population of Anatolia because of the wars the killings, the expulsions, so uh, Turkey was seeking uh, peasants to revitalize the agrarian economy. So the embassies in Sofia, in Belgrade, they were trying to recruit peasants willing to migrate to Turkey. So this was the case in Romania as well. And uh, these are Basto Kantula Sufi Tanriova, as he took the name, or Third name to introduce in Turkey. He discovered the Gagaos. And he was fascinated with them. So he considered them as the model Turkish peasant. Why? Because they were very secular. They were producing wine. They had sort of they don't forget to talk about their early republic. So there is a sort of a new 
project a new vision about Turkey and the Turkish people. And in the minds of many of the Turkish intellectuals, the peasants are very, sort of, uh, they're very conservative, very against progress, very against the modern way of life. So the Gagos appeared as a very modern peasant community that could sort of, uh, and this actually resonated with the reading of conservatism by some secularists in Turkey where they tried to identify conservatism with Islam. So they argued that Turkey, like Turkish underdevelopment was due to Islam, Sunni Islam, so the Gagos are Turks but without Islam. So that's why they're sort of, they live like this and not like the 90% of the peasants in, in, in Turkey, right? So he tried to recruit them and organize a mass migration of them to Turkey and apparently there was an interest, at least by a considerable part of the community. But interestingly, the whole move was rejected by the foreign ministry in Ankara. Uh, the foreign ministry sort of rejected this on the line that we would import a new Greek minority. And the argument was, as it appeared in newspapers of the time, but even in reports of the foreign ministry, is that it took us so much effort to get rid of the Greek population in Anatolia, and we will be introducing another Greek population from the back door. That was the sort of argument. So it's interesting to see how like, uh, this religious religion-based identification of communities in, uh, in the Balkans and Anatolia survived even the end of the Greek Turkish War and survived into the into Republican Turkey. So although Turkey was meant to be a secular state, now identifying Turkishness was still based on religion and on, not on ethnic descent because the Gagaos had a very strong claim of Turkic ethnic descent. Maybe stronger than most of the Turkish population at the time in Anatolia. So only few fellowships were given towards the end of the 30s, so there were some hundreds of Gagos who moved to Turkey. And because of the war, and the Second World War meant that they couldn't return to, to their home territory. Of course, then the Second World War was en ended, and then the Cold War started, so they couldn't return to the Soviet Republic of Moldova, so they end up staying in Turkey. So there is a, a, one of the uh, elements of the diaspora of the Gagos in Turkey refers to that. How things develop in the 19th, in the 20th century within the Soviet Union, there were increasing attempts to establish a sense of Gagos identity within the Soviet context. So alphabet was introduced, first literature, First sort of writings on Gagos identity. And of course, the independence of the Republic of Moldova was a great moment in that respect. The Gagos acquired autonomous status, the Gagos territor autonomous territorial unit. At some point, things became even quite tense. It's when the Transnistrian conflict started, which is the other sort of community of the Republic of Moldova, the sort of Transnistria Russian speakers were sort of ended up establishing a sort of a breakaway republic, an unrecognized international republic. So that goes came close to this point but didn't cross the line. So they're still part of uh, the Republic of Moldova. Nevertheless, they're quite affiliated with Russia. And religion is one of the instruments was for Russian influence. It is the 1990s when free nationalism developed this interest on the Gagos community. As I said, Bulgaria made a claim that the Gagos of Moldova are Bulgarians, and uh, because Bulgaria has a minority in Moldova anyway, so there are Bulgarian speakers living in the Republic of Moldova, so this helped quite a lot. What made things interesting was that Bulgaria employed a very liberal uh, nationality and passport recognition policy. So, uh, 
I think uh, maybe Cyprus knows about this. I think Bulgaria, Cyprus, and Malta were the three countries that were scrutinized by the European Commission because of their very liberal sort of attitudes in giving passports to non-nationals. So we got those community laws on it. Yeah, so practically anything that goes from Moldova who wanted to acquire Bulgarian passport would do so by simply stating that he is of Bulgarian descent. So this became a sort of opportunity for some of the Gagos to settle, to move to the European Union, given the fact that Bulgaria is a European Union member country. Greece had developed an interest in the Gagos community, particularly in the late, late 1990s and early 2000s. Through the councils of Provincia abroad, the Saeks in Bulgaria for the Municipal, which was an attempt to organize the Greek diaspora communities around the world. So the Gagos associations in Moldova were considered eligible to apply to become a member of the global Greek diaspora. So it was quite an interesting sort of move. And in that respect, the Greek Gagos community, the Gagos living in Greece were important. So in most cases, they were Gagos from, Greek, from Greece or associations of Greek Gagoses. And there are a couple of them, like a, a cultural association promoting the Gagos culture and identity in Greece. So they became the interlocutors and the sort of mediators between the Greek state and the Greek diaspora associations and the Gagos community in Moldova. So, and there were some Greek cultural centers, language sort of, uh, sort of, the university in Comrade sort of opened some uh, departments and sort of some centers for the study of Greek language and culture. Nevertheless, all this was really hit by the Greek crisis, with the fact that the Greek crisis sort of limited budgets for such initiatives, so these projects remain sort of unfinished. Turkey was another country that sort of developed an interest in the uh, 1990s, particularly Suleyman Demirel sort of. I think during a visit to Moldova, he made sort of very sort of ambitious statements about rebridging, sort of reconnecting the Gagos community with the historic sort of homeland of Anatolia. And here, Anatolia is the homeland again. And I remember, remember I mentioned the Seljuk sort of connection to, to this. So there are some fellowship programs still that operate in that respect. So they do qualify as. Unlike in the 30s, now they can qualify as Turkic communities abroad, so there's no sort of no more clear religious identification of identity. But uh, as I said before, now there is a sort of quite significant competition between the three communities. Uh, I would like to conclude my presentation, and I think we're, uh, we still have some minutes. I would like to show. Some information about a figure that played the role of this uh, leader that contributed to the establishment of Gagos identity in the interwar years. Remember when I was, talk I was talking about ethnic groups and national groups identifying the role of national uh, community leaders? So, Mikhail Chakir is a priest that lived in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he became one of the most important figures in the establishment of Gagos identity because he wrote the first history of the Gagos written by Gagos and in Gagos language. He's the first person who tried to give substance to the history and the, the culture of the community. Most interestingly, he lived through the Russian and the Romanian uh, years and he published his work in both languages so being able to speak in Gagos, Romanian and Russian gave him a very interesting position because he would negotiate with all authorities and he would try to sort of identify the position of the community and uh, if you look into his work uh, you'll find a lot of the pictures that I highlighted as conditions for the emergence of an identity. So 
he is the person who defines like Bessarabia as the homeland. So he forgets about Dobrocha. He solves the problem that you know this is our territory. You know, we don't have to go back to our former land. This is our land, this is where we will establish ourselves. <coughs> and uh, he tries to identify Gagao's culture, mainly in comparison with Bulgarian. So he tries to like look down upon Bulgarians and highlight that our culture is superior to the Bulgarian culture, so we have to be proud of being Gagao. It's not sort of a, a burden, but an honor to be a member of this community. And uh, the role of religious figures is very important. Of course, he himself is a priest. He's an intellectual as well, so he combines both authorities in front of his community. He also refers to other elders, other sort of religious figures. So one called Kasim uh, in, uh, in his work that play a major role in identifying what Gagao's identity is. He's very anti-communist and the atheist, so he sort of engages with the discourse of the interwar years. And uh, he also even comes to the point of referring to bad cultural habits, so like uh, um, Vitic culture is a very important part of the culture of the Gagaos, but alcoholism is not, so he tries to sort of identify the lines there. And uh, all sorts of other cultural information that try to make the Gagaos feel proud about themselves. So this is the most important feature that he tries to highlight. So I would argue that his work is very important as a work of a pioneer of uh, uh, a national building process, which has not completed yet, as I said. But uh, it raises a lot of interesting questions and discussion points. Uh, why? Because uh, he is also referring to <coughs> well-known Western sources. So he tries to refer to the Western literature about the Gagos community, but also tries to make an authenticity claim. You know, like we know better who we are, and we know it's, it's time for us to speak about ourselves, which is something that many, uh, many of these communities couldn't do. Imagine how many, like even in the Habsburg Empire, for example, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Ukrainians were not sort of didn't have their own intellectual leads for many years. It took them very, maybe a long time for them to develop their own an own sense of identity against the German or the Polish or the Russian version of, of their history. So this is what this priest is also doing. So to conclude, the Gagos comprise a very interesting case, breaking, uh, debunking ethnic and religious stereotypes about the way we understand identities in the Ottoman and post-Ottoman context. Gagao's uh, nation building remains active despite Bulgarian, Turkish, and Greek overtures towards them. <coughs> and uh, concluding, since we've talked about Greek relations with Gagao's community, there is a sort of interesting link that it appears a bit paradoxical, as I tried to highlight in the beginning, but this strong religious affiliation of Gagos community with the Greek Orthodox to that still comprises an interesting bridge between the Greek culture or the Greek diaspora and the Gagos community. So thanks very much. Different from the Turkish language, the Turkish alphabet. 
like of the Republic of Turkey. So there are additional letters because there are additional sounds as well. So they try to make a difference. You know, we have our own alphabet. This is not the Turkish alphabet. <coughs> if I'm not confusing my history, uh, uh, the Greek uh, revolution for independence started in what is now uh, Malta. Yes. And were this uh, population involved? They were involved, as far as I know. Yes. Yeah. So they participated in the Ypsilan trips. Yeah, they did. They did. They were part of this. Yes. There are stories, there are stories about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, Ypsilan um, used that those people because they uh, Turkish people couldn't identify them as non turkish so he used them as pioneers uh, to uh, uh, the Turkish uh, 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 people. So he he sent Turkish people into uh, those people into the Turkish uh, uh, places, and so he got a lot of information. In, in Greece or in uh, that? No, in that region. Well, in the region. Moldova, Moldova, Latvia. Yeah. Latvia. Yeah. Latvia. Yeah. Latvia. Yeah. Latvia. Yeah. And we have a second uh, um, uh, historical uh, uh, thing uh, related to that. When um, 1919, uh, the Greek army um, uh, went and uh, took over uh, his trains, uh, those people were the first who uh, joined the Greek army. From all uh, uh, from all the Greeks uh, from uh, the region. So, as I said, if you remember, I mentioned Bessarabia. The border between the Ottoman Empire and Russia became the River Prut. Mm -hmm. So, Ypsilanti crossed the River Prut to be, to start the Greek War of Independence, right? Mm -hmm. So, the Gagaus were on the northern side of the border, but they joined the forces and they collaborated in all ways with the Russian with the Russian, with the Russian uh, uh, army too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more recently, uh, there was some discussion whether they would be independent <coughs> or be incorporated into Romania. Mm -hmm. Was it? Well, M Moldova. There was a discussion about the future of Moldova. And there's a big discussion about there's a Moldovan language and what's the language, whether it's Romanian or not. There's a sort of another one, of, yet another of esoteric Balkan sort of conflicts. You know, that's very hard to follow. The Gagaus are very much against this because they feel that if Moldova joins Romania, they will be wiped. So they are already a small community in a small country, but if they become a very small community in a much bigger country, this is against their interest. And as I said before, this is one of the reasons why they become very handy in the hands of Russia. Because uh, just like with the Abkhaz and the Ossetians in Georgia, uh, very often small, there is a sort of, it's, a, it's an interesting situation, like, uh, like small communities are afraid of imperialism of small countries compared to the imperialism of Russia. So, like, just like the Abkhazians choose Russia and Georgia as a sort of like a rule, the Gagaus might be tempted to do that. But unlike the Transnistrians, we haven't come to the point of breaking away from the territory of Moldova. So, so far, the situation is peaceful. So, there's no sort of major conflict. Although it could be, it could be risky if there is a move to join Romania for the Republic of Moldova. It's likely that the Gagaus would break away. Go away. Like declare independent, like trust Istria like entity, like under the auspices of the protection of Russia. Yeah, I have, uh, just, this is all new to me. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Turkey has been occupying Moldova for And you mentioned that Ankara uh, was not filled with this because here you know, people are not Muslims, right? They're not Sunni Muslims. Uh, so uh, why did they why did they go? Because some of them went, I gather. Some of them go. But they went on the, on an individual basis, so they were so they it wasn't won a fellowships. Okay. There wasn't an organized group migration. 
which happened for other Muslims. So the migration project continued. So hundreds of thousands of Muslims from Romania settled in Turkey, but okay. without it, and Bulgaria without the Gagos. So they were exempted in the 1930s when this was so Of course, then the Second World War, the Cold War happens, and there's no other window of opportunity for this to happen. So this, it, the issue is raised again only in the, after the end of the Cold War. It almost seems as, uh, I, was, I might be wrong on this, but it almost seems like the draw really for, for these different migrations uh, were based uh, uh, maybe more on religion than ethnicity. Am I right on this? Well, definitely so, because, but that's a sort of the paradox of Republican Turkey. Republican Turkey consists of millions of Muslim refugees and immigrants that leave their former Ottoman territories and gather in what ends up becoming the Republic of Turkey. But at the same time, the Republic of Turkey declared itself to be secular. So sort of, it's sort of, there's a very interesting paradox. Uh, so, uh, given the, the, the issues with Transistra, um, is, it, is there like kind of opposition to uh, nation building of, um, within the guy who's from Moldova? And alternatively, is there support for this nation building from other foreign countries? Opposition to nation building from inside, from Moldova? Yeah, from Moldova. Well, Moldova has conceded, has conceded this autonomy. But definitely, as we know from the interwar years, they would be interested in incorporating them and preventing this nation building process to continue. This might have been one of the reasons why things are not moving so fast in that respect. But on the other hand, the Gagos community has developed its international links. And the Rob diaspora is very interesting. So the fact that there are Gagos in Ukraine, Bulgaria, and Turkey and Greece also has a different dimension. So but one needs to also consider the fact that we're talking about a very poor region. So Moldova is poor in general, and the Gagos, Yerin is one of the poorest regions of, of the country. So people have maybe other priorities first to meet, you know, for sort of develop all the political projects that we are discussing here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. This is fascinating. And I'm not so well known, so an opportunity to hear a lot. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's, it's very interesting that they have forgotten the homeland, because I think the homeland in, in, in uh, Balkan nationalism mm -hmm. is something that is in the core of the concept. So I think this is very interesting. Um, and secondly, I would like to ask you, uh, something, uh, tell us more about the Gagos community in Greece. Yeah. So I agree this uh, re redefining the homeland is a very interesting sort of an original sort of phenomenon. But it also it is also very pragmatic in that respect because of the weakness of the community, the small the demographic sort of size of it. And the fact that they've acquired this autonomy in Moldova. So all this provide an opportunity for a redefinition of the original Kagao's territory in their own Moldova. Regarding Greece, there are some associations that promote the Gagos culture. Some of them are in Evros, so like you know, the Evros, there are three or three. There are some books. <coughs> Most of them are not academic, I would say. They're sort of a recollection of memories, cultural elements. And there is also a very interesting sort of uh, struggle to convince that we are not Turks, mm -hmm. but we are pure original Greek, so sort of under this. Hmm? We are not Jews. We are not Jews. That's the sort of, that's, that, that's the argument, <laughs> sort of coming out. And very often it comes as a sort of uh, uh, reference to the Thracian sort of tribes that I also implied in this. So uh, it is a very interesting uh, dynamic process that is going on. And I don't know, maybe you can uh, yeah. yeah. sort of... Hello, Mr. Navarez I am Gagaus. This is why I'm here. I'm a Greek Gagaus. Um, <clears throat> I want just to say that we never uh, uh, did identify ourselves as uh, Turks. Um, 
and uh, in our oral uh, tradition, we know that we are from that area, um, and we know that we had to move several times, so uh, our homeland is there where we live at the moment. So there is, um, and I have to say, uh, till 1991, uh, the Greek uh didn't know the existence of uh, Gagauzia and the autonomous uh, republic of uh, Gagauzia or the Gagauz people in Moldova. Uh, we never heard about them. You, we knew that uh, Gagauz people uh, were living in Bulgaria, uh, but uh, we didn't know that uh, there is a big uh, uh, community, Gagauz community in Moldova. So, um, uh, of course, there are a lot of stories, but in our oral history, Kaikaus uh, II uh, is not mentioned, uh, so we don't know about that. And we identified ourselves as our grandparents uh, and grandparents did as Rum uh, in general, so belonging to the Rumi land. And Orthodox faith uh, is more important than nationality. So when we uh, uh, reconnected with uh, our brothers in uh, Gagauzia, uh, we were surprised that we have the same uh, dialect, the same uh, Turkish dialect, the same uh, traditions, uh, same songs, same music, same dances, um, uh, even uh, same cultures in the church. So uh, they are now more Russian oriented uh, in their faith and were more Greek oriented, of course. Uh, but when we come together, we see that we are one. There is a, a, a unity we need. Um, uh, and I want to add that um, uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate tried to uh, save <coughs> those people um, from uh, becoming uh, Bulgarians, to becoming the, getting the, the uh, Bulgarian nationality, identity, and uh, sent uh, Cappadocian uh, Turkish speaking priests and teachers from uh, Cappadocia, from Anatolia, from uh, Karamania, Karamadu, uh, to the villages in Hafsa, in Eastern Thrace, um, to teach them with the Greek letters the Turkish language. Uh, and uh, they celebrated. They started to celebrate uh, the, the uh, liturgies, the services in that uh, language. Um, but uh, until that time, uh, the services were only Greek. Um, so there is more a Gagaus identity than anything <laughs> else. And I just I want to add, uh, there is a movement of young people today, Gagaus people from, from Greece, um, and we uh, went a DNA test find out if we are Turkish or not. And uh, uh, no one has a percent of uh, Turkish blood uh, or DNA. So we are, most of the, most of the cases, we are half Greek and half Balkan. This is what the test says. Excuse me, Father, may I ask you, uh, may I ask you <coughs> what jurisdiction, religious jurisdiction, do the Dagoans worship at the end of the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople? Mm -hmm. Uh, the ones in Bulgaria nowadays are under the Bulgarian patriarchate. Okay, the ones in Greece are under the ecumenical. How about the ones in Moldova? They are under the Russian patriarchate, under yeah. Moscow patriarchate. Yeah, the they identify themselves uh, uh, with the Russian Orthodox faith and not with the Romanian or Moldavian. Okay. So, uh, uh, their territory is a, a Romanian bishop and a Russian bishop, but the Gagos people are under the Russian bishop. <coughs> <laughs> Wait, what liturgical language do they use? They use the dose. <coughs> the dose yeah. So, what's the current uh, estimated population of. Uh, yes, yes. It's about 250,000 people in Moldova. Moldova, 50,000 in Ukraine, Bulgaria, and about 30 to 40,000 in Greece. So, overall, maybe if we have the. Diaspora and people. I didn't quite understood why they lost the original homeland. Uh, they, they were forced out because they were not exactly forced out. This is something that the Russians very often did. They did it also in the, in the Caucasus. So there are some communities, Greek communities in Georgia and South Carolina. 
that they were mixing their Zurum from Eastern Anatolia when the Russians invade the territory and they, they occupy a big part of Ottoman land and they sign a deal and they annex a part of this. So they gave incentives to the Christians living in that part to be returned so that they would settle under Russian rule because that would be safer for the Russians because so they would have a sort of a friendly population settling there. And they would give material incentives, so they would give land to peasants, to land to landless peasants. It would be a very strong incentive for them to move there. So the Gagaos moved from Dobruja to Moldova under such a scheme. So the Russians gave them free land, and they wanted them to protect the new frontier against the Ottomans. But not all of them moved. So there were populations in, in Dobruja that survived until today. Yes. And there are regular uh, annual meetings of Ukagos people in Greece, Bulgaria, and uh, Ukraine and Moldova. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you didn't really touch on it too much, but I'm curious about how the Gagalos people fared during the Second World War. Because mm -hmm. Bessarabia was a very geopolitically contentious part. And even where they fall in line, places like Bulgaria and Greece, this fell on both sides of both the Axis and Allied powers. So, mm -hmm. did they align with Russia? How were they able to stay together as a community and endure such a conflict? In principle, because they, they, it's what we I tried to describe with the Georgians and the Abkhazians, because they were more concerned about Romanian nationalism compared to Russian nationalism, so they sided with the Soviet Union in that respect. So. And to the extent that the Soviets won the war, this sort of may have contributed to the fact that they were, their position was consolidated in the Republic of Moldova. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Greece and Bulgaria, as far as I know, they followed the mainstream. So there was no particular sort of position of the Gagos community against the mainstream position. Yes. I, uh, I find it fascinating, and you know, I, I have a, a, a lot of. Uh, Questions and, and, and thoughts of, in, in your presentation. One of which is that the whole notion of, you know, um, in geopolitics, we constantly look at the boxes, but we forget like the people inside those boxes, mm -hmm. and how complex that 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 structure is, especially in, in the Balkans, and how this new emergent nationalism, the like Bulgarian, Greek, and Turkish, have really eliminated all this ethnic uh, that have resided. But even so how strong that connection is, that it's almost like the, the memory of something of uh, a leg being cut off or amputated, the, the memory is still there. And I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. Not only that, you know, the, the issue of like, you know, um, as Father Naora said, you know, um, we are where the, the homeland is, you know, it's, it's that classic, you know, um, Greek phrase, you know, the whole notion of like, I am like where my country is going back to Themistocles and taking the Athenians on the ships and says this is Athens, you know, go anywhere. So how how does that I mean is that is that the reason why those those populations survive in their ability to have the memory and are you looking to redefine nationalism in some way for smaller communities? You know, we now we're like fascinated with the Kurds and where is the Kurdish situation where is the Kurdish territorial but is, Kurdish, is the Kurdish state being created in some way in a place that might be not necessarily to the homeland where it becomes a geopolitical threat, but it's something that's carried out in, in a place that's fairly safe, and then you have that Kurdish memory somewhere or another. Do you see any parallels there? Well, like, I think in the Greek case is very relevant to that too. The modern state yeah. of Greece was established in this part of the Balkans that was the least contentious, the least problematic for the Ottoman sort of center of all the politics of yeah. European countries at the time. So it is, it is like, yeah. like talking about the Kurdish issue, it's completely, it's a very big, very important issue. We forget, of course, that the, Istanbul is the biggest Kurdish city today. Mm -hmm. So the population dynamics can make things more complex and sort of 
interdependence and interconnections between Turkish and the Kurdish element in Turkey and beyond that are quite important. And, uh, sort of very, we need to consider them as well. Uh, in the case of the Gagaus, uh, the 